Okay. So good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Fabator Samuelson. I'm the director of Jewish studies at ASU. And I'm very glad to open the public event for the Center for Jewish Studies uh, for this semester, which is spring 2023. Uh, first, I would like to apologize uh, for the technical challenges that we experienced in January and those challenges uh, prevented us from holding the planned events and we also had to reschedule the three lectures by Rabbi Address, who will focus on living longer, living better. So his lecture will be delivered on February 20th, February 27th, and March 6th. And I apologize for uh, any inconvenience in case you experience such inconvenience. And I very much hope that you will be able to attend his lectures. The month of February indeed will be very filled with activities. Uh, in addition to those lectures by Rabbi Address, we will host a lecture by Professor Joel Gerboff from ASU. That's going to be uh, on Thursday, February 16th. That's next week. And he will focus on the American Jewish Historical Societies. Uh, and on Sunday, February 26th, we're going to hold an international conference on Judaism, Jews, and Artificial Intelligence. And that would be quite a day. It's going to be a whole day event. And I very much uh, hope that many of you will attend. Now, these public uh, programs illustrate our commitment to uh, public education. We consider Jewish education as a lifelong learning experience, not something that you just do in a classroom uh, for an academic degree, but rather something that you do for uh, the entire duration of one's life in various um, settings. Our approach, both in our lectures and in our courses, um, our approach is distinctly interdisciplinary and we pay attention to Jewish civilization as a whole. We cover Jewish history, the Jewish religion, Jewish culture, and we bring into our discussion a, a, a whole range of academic disciplines, whether it's history and sociology, religious studies, philosophy, comparative literature, and the arts. And that approach, I have to say, has been modeled by Professor Salo Wittmeyer Baron, uh, which I think many people would agree was the greatest scholar of Jewish history, religion, and culture in the 20th century. Professor Baron was educated in Europe, uh, where he earned, at the University of Vienna, he earned three doctoral degrees, he came to the United States in 1927, and all his academic career was at Columbia University, from nine, roughly from 1930 to 1963, uh, when he retired. Uh, we held, in 2015, we held a commemorative conference uh, for Salo Baron on his 120th uh, birthday. We held it at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland, where Professor Baron studied. I'm not sure if he, I don't remember if he got his BA there, but he definitely studied the, the beginning of his academic career was there. It was a wonderful conference and it came out as a book in 2017. Now, Professor Baron's daughter, Dr. Shoshana Baron Tanser lives in Phoenix and she serves on the advisory board of, of Jewish studies. Shoshana and her late husband, Robert Tanser have been instrumental in making Jewish studies at ASU as successful as it has been. Uh, Shoshana and Robert Tanser established the Baron Dissertation Award, which is given every three years for the best dissertation in Jewish history in that period of time. And the focus of the dissertations is on American Jewish history. You may recall those of, of you who've been with our programs before, we uh, awarded that, award, that dissertation award to Ayelet Brin. Uh, she did her work at the University of Pennsylvania and her topic was on gender, mass culture, and the American Yiddish press. Uh, tonight, we're hosting Dr. Sandra Fox, who received her honorary mention at this Baron Dissertation Award. And her dissertation, which was done at New York University in 2018, was titled, Here We Are Real Jews, 
producing authentic Jews in post-war American Jewish summer camps, 1945 to 1980. That was the title of her dissertation. And the committee was very impressed by her comparative and vivid analysis. And we thought that it, she deserves an honorary mention. Now, Shoshana Tenser could not be with us tonight but she has a few words directly to Professor Fox, and I would like to share those words with you. So, Dr. Fox, I'm so sorry that I'm not able to join you this evening, and I'm really looking forward to seeing your presentation on tape. Your fascinating dissertation in the history, on the history of uh, Jewish camps in the United States brought back vivid memories of my association with two of them, Massad in Pennsylvania, where I was a camper, and Modi'in in Maine, a few years later, where I was a counselor. Your analysis of the mission of each kind of camp enlightened me. I'm sure that my father, Salo Baron, would also have been interested in the topic and in your scholarly approach to it. Wishing you all the best in your future career, Shoshana Tenser. So now with these wonderful words, I would like to formally introduce Dr. Shoshana, Dr. Sandra Fox, sorry, Dr. Sandra Fox, uh, who uh, is the, Gold, the Goldstein Gorin Visiting Assistant Professor of Hebrew and Judaic Studies at New York University. She's also the Director of the Archive of the American Jewish Left in the Digital Age. Prior to her current position, she held several postdoctoral positions uh, first at Stanford University, uh, actually in two separate uh, formulations, but roughly from 2019 to 2022, and, the, and before that at Ben-Gurion University in Israel. Her research encompasses several themes, American Jewish history, the history of youth and childhood, Yiddish culture, and the history of sexuality. And her book, under the title, The Jews of Summer, Summer Camp and Jewish Culture in Post-War America, Post America is that. actually being published this very month by Stanford University Press. Here you can see the book. It's already physically out. So in many ways, this lecture tonight is kind of a book launch, even though we didn't plan it that way because we invited her to do this thing quite a long time ago. So without further ado, I will let Dr. Fox explain her excellent analysis of summer camp in America. And Dr. Fox's screen is all yours. Okay, hi, thanks so much. Um, what a lovely introduction and thank you Shoshana whenever you get a chance to watch this. Um, it's, so, it's so nice that people you know, who read the dissertation are now going to see the kind of new ways that I talk about similar research because it's been many, many years and now it's a book and books are usually a little different than dissertations. So it'll be interesting to, to see how that goes for, for a few of you. Um, okay, so I'll begin. Um, I'm gonna talk for about probably 40 minutes or so. Some parts of it are, you know, written, some parts of it are a little bit more off the cuff um, and there'll be a lot of visual elements. And then I'm really excited to take all of your questions at the end. So in the late 1960s, a group of campers at a camp called Camp Hemshech, which was a Yiddish cultural sleepaway camp in upstate New York, took a field trip to see a local theater production of Fiddler on the Roof. At Hemshech, campers spoke Yiddish on a daily basis immersed themselves in the literature and history of Ashkenazi Jewry, and commemorated the recent Holocaust through celebrating and emulating the Yiddish-speaking culture that thrived in Europe prior. To one counselor named Joe, watching Fiddler that day evoked a surprising feeling, less like watching a fictionalized depiction of the past than an expression of life at Hemshech itself, causing the campers and the counselors to feel, quote, very much like the chosen people. As the group watched the play and quote, more importantly, watched the, the rest of the audience watch the play, they felt almost as though as they were in on a very special secret. After the campers ended the night of performances by singing Yiddish songs to an audience of vacationing middle-class Jews from the city, Joe experienced a quote unquote, inescapable feeling of authenticity. Drawing a clear line of distinction between the audience for whom Fiddler reflected its nostalgic past and the Hemshech campers and counselors who saw themselves as active defenders and the participants uh, in the culture on stage, 
Joe distinguished camp life and the kinds of Jews that campers became through it from mainstream American Jewish culture, which she saw as detached from its cultural inheritance and from real Jewishness. Placing Yiddishism, a 19th century Jewish linguistic nationalism, and Bundism, a Jewish form of socialism rooted in Eastern Europe at the center of its mission, the leaders of Camp Hemshech operated on a very different political wavelength from the vast majority of Jews at the time. By the late 1960s, not only had Yiddish ceased to be an everyday vernacular among most American Jews, most Jews had also consciously worked to disentangle themselves from the kinds of socialist or communist affiliations that Hemshech promoted uh, in response to the scrutiny that Jews faced under McCarthyism. And in comparison to more well-known Jewish educational summer camping networks like Camp Ramah or the Reform Camps or Young Judea, Hemshech had a very small population serving around only 100 uh, campers each year at one campsite. And most of them were the first generation Americans, um, were first gen generation Americans and the children of Holocaust survivors. But while Hemshech represented a marginal ideology with a shrinking audience, the counselor's description of the camp's fiddler excursion really mirrored the purposes of a much wider variety of post-war Jewish camps. To bring children and teenagers closer to their leaders or their movement's particular visions of authentic Jewishness, conceptions based on the ideas and ideas of Jews from other times and places, like pre-war Eastern Europe or fantasies of an ideal contemporary elsewhere, usually in Israel. Camp leaders' interest in simulating other times and places had much to do with how they felt about their current moment and place in America. While American Jews had steadily begun to climb into their middle classness prior to World War II, Jewish soldiers returning from the from um, sorry, Jewish soldiers returning home from the war found themselves catapulted into middle class comfort, but benefiting from housing loans and educational scholarships offered to white veterans only. As they moved from cities to suburbs, the synagogue center with its sisterhoods, men's clubs, and other social offerings provided new Jewish suburbanites official and tangible ways to affiliate with Judaism, replacing the informal neighborhood-based affiliations of urban communities of earlier in the century. Mirroring middle-class uh, America's mounting focus on the child during the baby boom, furthermore, children and adolescents became the center of Jewish communal priorities. Coinciding with what many have described as a golden age of American Judaism, a time marked by social mobility, affluence, suburbanization, and the development of what Herbert Gans coined child-centered Judaism, the period saw the dramatic growth of synagogue Hebrew schools, nursery schools, youth groups, and of course, summer camps. Summer camps predate the post-World War II period by several decades. In the progressive era, Jews alongside fresh air reformers and the settlement house movement, uh, the Boy Scouts of America, Christian congregations, they all began to build residential summer camps for children. Providing a reprieve from what progressives saw as the negative impacts of urban life on children, philanthropic Jewish camps offered recreation in nature with the comfort of socializing with one's own fellow Jews. Private camps for middle-class Jewish children, on the other hand, offered opportunities for families denied entry to Christian majority camps. In the 1920s, a small number of new camps built by Hebrew-oriented, Yiddish-oriented, Zionist, and Jewish educational organizations were established, incorporating some elements of Jewish education, leadership training, and language learning. In an industry focused on recreation, immersion in nature, socialization, and Americanization, however, camps with intensely Jewish missions were originally on the margins of the Jewish camping sector. This began to change, however, in the years between the two world wars and took off primarily in the aftermath of World War II when Jews experienced these new economic and social conditions, as well as new anxieties about the Jewish future. Of course, growing affluence and rising social status afforded Jews many benefits. As they climbed the educational and professional ladder, most Jews happily embraced their standing and the material and psychological comforts that came along with it. The sizable and attractive synagogue buildings and Jewish community centers that Jews built reflected their comfort in post-war suburbia and their plans to stay there for the long haul. At the same time, these dramatic socioeconomic transitions also provoked deep anxieties among communal leaders. Many Jews felt intensely ambivalent about their socioeconomic ascent, 
worrying that Jewish cultural authenticity would not survive the comfort of affluence. Rather than celebrating their new place in American society, educators, rabbis, and lay leaders projected these concerns onto youth and also their parents, citing a growing need to develop Jewish identity in children. Having never experienced for themselves life in Jewish urban ghettos, let alone in Eastern European shtetls, a diverse onslaught of American Jews worried that the younger generation would simply never come to understand quote unquote real Jewishness on their own. Without intervention, they argued, authentic Jewish culture would simply disappear. The full realizations of the Holocaust devastation added a level of urgency to their distress about the state of post-war Jewishness. Without European Jewry to look to and with Israel's future still uncertain, post-war American Jewish leaders saw themselves as responsible for carrying Judaism and Jewish culture forward into the future. For many Jewish educators, producing an educational, immersive, and almost emotional affective Jewish camp experiences in the Holocaust aftermath was a matter of cultural life or death, of continuity or discontinuity. Ironically, affluence was at the heart of their concerns about authenticity, but it also proved absolutely essential in allowing the Jewish camping sector to flourish. In the early 20th century, thousands of Jewish children attended philanthropic camps that served immigrants and the children of immigrants, or these smaller kind of private camps for middle class and upper middle class Jews who had arrived earlier in, um, in American Jewish history. But post-war Jews had more resources to put towards their children's education and recreation and the parents' enjoyment of uh, their own child free summers. Um, the more that families could afford to send children to camp, the more that the yearly migration of the young from Jewish urban, urban neighborhoods and suburbs to the American countryside became a, distinguish, a distinguishing element of Jewish middle-classness. And for thousands of young Jews, a rite of passage. This sunny economic picture also meant that Jewish movements and institutions had the ability to purchase acres of land where they built modern, comfortable, and permanent campsites and could provide scholarships for uh, families who could not afford camp without assistance. So here's an example of some, you know, features of modern camping. Uh, you know, in the left side, you have a bunk or some sort of building. Uh, prior to the 1940s, a lot of camps that were, were less permanent in their, sorry, that, uh, prior to the 1920s, camps were often less permanent in their sites. You might sleep in tents or the camp might move from place year to year. Um, but modern sleepaway camping has these features of permanent buildings and more kind of established facilities. So going back to this interesting tension about what affluence both allows and creates in terms of anxiety, the Jewish camp, summer camp really offers the unique lens between um, for examining tensions between the post-war period's goldenness and also its ambivalence. Rather than sitting in contradiction, affluence, comfort, social mobility, and anxiety of cult over cultural decline that Jews experience really fed off of each other, pushing Jewish culture and communal life into new directions. The educational summer camp was one such direction, the dazzling similarity of camp structures and methods over the course of the post-war period, revealing their leaders underlying shared hopes and dreams. That camp could counteract the downsides of the presence, propelling positive, real, or authentic Jewishness into the future. So tonight I will be bringing those adult visions of Jewishness to the fore by looking at how leaders organize various aspects of everyday life within the Jewish camp. And yet the story of Jewish summer camping, like most history in general, has mainly been told through the eyes of the ideologues, communal leaders, educators, and rabbis, mostly male and mostly middle age, who constructed and directed camps with the dreams, with dreams of molding the next generation of young Jews. Um, so here in this image, you have kind of that example. Um, on the right side, you have a camp director facing the children. It, it kind of evokes this idea of the camp director's power to shape their identities. But adults actually constituted the minority of camps populations, as this picture also shows us, right? Their missions and plans, the adult missions and their plans only represents one side of a much more nuanced story. Indeed, camps flourish through inter inter a, sorry, intergenerational negotiation permissiveness, and attention to children and teenagers' peer culture. Jewish children and teenagers arrived seeking fun, freedom, play, escape, and romance, and generally prioritized these elements over camp's ideological missions. 
<clears throat> Leaders formulated their missions in advance of the summer, but life at camp proved much more complicated. To make a mark on campers, staff had to get their buy-in, answering to their needs, desires, and interests. A camp's ability, ability to succeed educationally and economically fundamentally required their campers to believe in the mission. Children and teens, therefore, wielded tremendous power within the camp environment in their everyday reactions, their decisions to engage or disengage, to nod in agreement, or to roll an eye in defiance. <clears throat> Looking at the top down and the bottom up in this way, tonight I'll highlight how dynamics between adult and youth, child and teen, staff and camper, not only shaped the texture of everyday life within camps, but actually reconstituted various elements of American Jewish culture, both within and outside of them with several lasting implications. <clears throat> Before we get into the details though, I wanna zoom out a bit and just explain a little bit about the camps I focus on in this project, because of course, there are many kinds of Jewish summer camps and often in the q and I get asked, why didn't you talk about the camp I went to? And that's, a, you know, it's a, always a lovely question because I know people are proud of the camps they went to. Um, but this project deals with a certain subset of um, Jewish camps, knowing that there are many, many others. I found that camps affiliated with Zionist movements, Yiddish cultural institutions, and the conservative and reform movements of Judaism, all of which began in the Northeast, but spread to the Midwest, South, and West Coast, were by far the most emblematic of the trends I've discussed so far. Zionist camps aim to mold Jewish American youth into at the very least supporters of, if not future citizens of Israel. Some were socialist, others more mainstream, and some were also right-wing or revisionist. Yiddishist camps focused their efforts on defending and spreading the Yiddish language and promoting what they broadly called Yiddish culture, including Yiddish literature, theater, and music. They often also touted socialism or communism. Denominational camps, those founded and ran by the reform and conservative movements in particular, promoted the religious and cultural ideals of those movements, shaping their programs to mold campers into future religious and communal leaders. I should note that a much, a much larger and more defined Orthodox camping sector emerged in, in earnest only in the late 1960s as modern Orthodoxy began to grow in size and self-assuredness as a community. Um, so while some Orthodox camps receive attention in my research, their mostly divergent timeline kind of keeps them apart from the more liberal and also secular elements of the Jewish community at the time. These camp types did not encapsulate, as I said, all of the Jewish camps of the period. Dozens of camps sponsored by the Young Men's Hebrew Association or Jewish community, the Jewish Community Center movement um, that were perhaps mostly recreational uh, included some cultural and religious practices throughout the post-war era, as did some uh, private summer camps owned by Jewish families. Maybe they were white on Shabbat and did certain elements of Jewish practice. From the 1940s through the 1970s, however, Zionist, Yiddishist, Reform, and Conservative camps stood out in the degree to which religious, political, and linguistic ideologies shaped the details of everyday camp life and how much, their ener how much energy their leaders invested in inculcating youth with Jewish beliefs, practices, cultural touchstones, and political attitudes. I think another indication of why these camps, um, how I know that these camps were kind of different than others is the mere fact that they have such thorough archives. Because the people who, who ran these camps believed so strongly in their mission, they believed they were indeed saving the Jewish people. They saved a lot of stuff. And I do not see that necessarily with all camps um, across the board. So it, it, it's, the archives can also tell you a lot about the people who ran institutions. So these four kinds of camps uh, within which there's diversity had different ideologies to be sure. But what's interesting about looking at them together is the fact that they use very similar methods of producing what they considered to be ideal or authentic Jewishness within their camps. For them, Jewish authenticity, authenticity was inherently located elsewhere in other historical periods and other cultures. Take for example, example Labish Lehrer, the, the camp director I showed you before who was a prominent leader in Yiddish education and founded and directed a camp called Camp Boybrick for the purpose of educating the students of the Sholem Aleichem Folk Institute, a Yiddish folk shul in New York City during the summer months. In a 1959 essay, Labish Lehrer explained, those who have ever been under the sway of authentic Jewish tradition must have felt the disparity of some basic elements of Jewish and American culture, a disparity 
which has led to interminable conflicts between the older and younger generations. Rabbi David Mulligner, uh, an important Camp Ramah leader, echoed similar ideas in the late 1960s in a text regarding Jewish education. He believed that camps at their best should, quote, serve American Jewry by providing creative, imaginative, and positive programs, which will strengthen Jewish life here and assure its continuity under optimum conditions. While each camp had its own ideologically imbued vision of authenticity, Maligner used Israel while Lehrer used Yiddish culture as his guide, these leaders shared a core belief that authentic Jewishness would not naturally occur in the American environment. Rather, it had to be fabricated, produced, and they believed that sleepaway camps would provide um, ideal atmospheres for its production due to their immersive 24-7 quality. <clears throat> Becoming authentic meant transforming into a Jew from another time or place, and educators structured their camps as simulations of the perceived lifestyles of such Jews as Zionist pioneers and soldiers, Warsaw Ghetto resistance fighters, Yiddish-speaking socialists and writers, Maccabees, and other heroes of Jewish history accordingly, all untainted by comfortable affluent American suburbia. This fantasy that camps had the unpar an unparalleled power to mold children deeply informed the structure of the camp's programs, including at their most basic level, their schedules and their environments. At the most basic level, leaders organized time at camp to simulate these other people, these other Jews from other times and places. Through the content and overall flow of camp's daily, weekly, and monthly schedules, camp leaders projected and enacted their fantasies on campers, inflecting every hour and the week with Shabbat at its end, or the Sabbath, with their specific visions of ideal Jewishness. So this is a, um, a camp schedule from Camp Tel Yehuda from 1953. You'll notice that most of the, the times in the schedule are written in Hebrew. Um, this is pretty common in a, Camp Tel Yehuda was a Zionist camp. Um, I created a sort of typical daily schedule, which was very easy to do. At all of these different kinds of camps, they almost had the exact same orders and the exact same content from day to day with different ideologies poking through. So for instance, this, you know, this morning schedule, um, wake up, there's some sort of morning ritual, prayer in camps that embrace, you know, forms of religious ritual. Um, a lot of the socialist camps did calisthenics to get kids up and moving. Most of the camps, or almost all the camps actually did flag raising and which, which flag they rose was a question. Um, you know, whether they, they fly just the Israeli, the American flag or also the Israeli flag, um, whether they create a Jewish people's flag in the case of Bundes and other kinds of socialist and not necessarily Zionist leaning camps. Um, they would have an educational activity, which would of course be different from place to place. Uh, most of them had some form of work during the day. The idea that campers were going to work together to form the camp environment or clean the camp environment was very crucial. Um, and then you have, you know, rest hour, free time, some kind of sports activity. Um, maybe you work again. That was pretty common in the post-war period. And then there'd be like arts and crafts, music, dance, theater, choice period, all these different things. And the thing is that they're similar on the page, but the content of them is very different from camp to camp. And I'm going to highlight that in the next couple of slides. So dance is a good example. Um, Israeli dancing, Jewish folk dancing was a huge part of camp life, specifically at camps imbued with Zionism. Um, Ramah camps didn't embrace necessarily the political forms of Zionism that other, that Zionist movements embraced, but they did embrace um, forms of Hebrew culture and uh, cultural Zionism. So uh, Israeli dances were, were a crucial part of the program for many, many kinds of Jewish camps. Here's another example from Camp Sedgwin, which was an educational Jewish camp uh, that no longer uh, exists. Um, I mentioned work before. So that work could be things like planting a garden. It could be cleaning. It could be building parts of camp life. So this is from uh, a camp called Camp Hemshech. Uh, I know that because in the back, I mean, I know that because I found it, but I also know that because in the back, they have this sign that says Haverschaft, which was the camp's motto. It meant like camaraderie. It also means friendship, but in this case, because of the socialism, it also means camaraderie. 
but I have pictures of, of kids doing the same exact thing at Camp Masad, which was mentioned before, I guess Shoshana went to Camp Masad, this Hebraic summer camp that was very deeply Zionist. So again, similar activities, different ideological lenses informing the reason they're doing it. Um, the ideologies of camps also appeared in, in their spatial uh, organization, or at least in the names of locations. So just like we saw from Camp Tel Yehuda, a schedule with Hebrew, this is the new campsite plan for the Yiddish imbued uh, Camp Hemshech that shows that um, they also had Yiddish names for all the places around camp. So again, different languages, but being utilized in very, very similar symbolic ways. Um, Okay. Oh yeah, some other things about space. Uh, the camps that, that practice religious ritual would have places to do that, you know, uh, some sort of site for, for their for their to be lot, for their prayers. Um, you would not see that at Yiddish imbued summer camps, which were staunchly secular. So there are differences in their space. Um, another thing that might be different from one camp to another is a lot of Zionist camps um, had programs for teenagers where teens lived in tents and kind of mimicked the kibbutz style of living uh, with a communal chaderochel, a, a cafeteria, and having to plan their own days. So that's a feature of Zionist camping that you don't see so much in other kinds of camps. So similarities and also differences. Here's one of those uh, great tent examples. Okay. Um, one feature of everyday life at camp was, of course, play. And there are various forms of play within the life of the summer camp. From the beginning of American summer camping, progressive educational philosophies underpinned the enterprise, with camp leaders arguing that play and recreation proved vital to social development and education. Jewish educators of the early 20th century adopted these ideas too, aided by the heavily Jewish professions of social work and social science. However, the games they had campers play took new forms and purposes in the post-war decades. Through role-playing games and what many social workers called sociodrama, socio various forms of play at camp worked to make the simulation of Jewish lifestyles that were apparent in various aspects, various aspects of the daily schedules all the more direct. Orchestrated and curated by directors and educators influenced by Jewish social science, campers took on the roles of historical and contemporary Jews from other parts of the world through imaginative and performative play. So here's an example of um, one of these of one of these kinds of play, which this might have been a stage play. I think it's possible that it was a stage play. Unclear what the play was, but you see here um, children from Camp Masad, this very Zionist Hebrew, mostly Hebrew speaking camp, or at least aspirationally Hebrew speaking camp. Um, there, they seem to be role playing some aspect of Zionist settlement in Palestine, um, sitting around a campfire. They're holding things that look like guns um, and. I don't know what they're doing because all we have is this photograph, but an example of bringing the visions of Zionism um, that they that they infuse in the daily schedule into various forms of play and simulation. This is from Camp Hemshech, which I have a lot of photos from because their alumni just really are very good at giving me photos. Um, and again, I don't have a lot of context for what's going on here, but we see two campers um, dressed up in various forms of, I guess, traditional Jewish garb. Now, this is interesting because it is this secular camp, but this is the same camp from the very, very beginning with Fiddler on the Roof, right? So they're secular, but they also do look back on the Eastern European, more traditional Jewish past with a lot of nostalgia and love. And so they bring that into their play a lot of the time. So you have, you know, I think a, a, a girl camper um, dressed up like a kind of Hasidic man and a pregnant wife uh, next to her. Also from Camp Hemshech, boys dress up apparently as tailors. So are they playing, you know, Jews on the Lower East Side earlier in the century or further back in Eastern Europe? It could be either way. Um, play also applies to color war, which was often called Maccabiyah which while recreational also drew um, inspiration from the ideologies of camps. Um, another example from, from a Maccabiya color war, this is from Camp Hemsha. The camp, different camps would have different themes for their color war activities. Uh, just to explain, because maybe people who didn't go to camp don't know about this, color war is, is when an entire camp uh, is broken into 
two, three or four teams uh, divided, you know, like red, yellow, blue, green, and, and they wear that color. And then they, they duke it out for, you know, a day to three days on those teams doing all sorts of activities, mostly sports and active activities, but also camps would have like Bible quiz or other things like a Jewish history quiz, things to kind of insert the intellectual and other elements of the ideology. But also the teams would be very revealing of their ideologies. So at Camp Hemshech, again, you know, this Yiddish summer camp, you had teams like, camp, you know, Team Yudlamid Peretz, uh, Team Shalom Aleichem, um, evoking, you know, the Yiddish literature and this tradition. Whereas at Camp Masad, they would have themes that all had to do with Zionism. Another aspect of camp life within the kind of monthly or summer schedule was um, Holocaust memorialization. Um, a lot of camps, most camps utilize the Jewish holy day of Tisha B'Av, which is the only holiday to fall during the summer months as the main moment for marking the Holocaust alongside a whole host of other Jewish tragedies. Um, while the avowedly secular Yiddish camp like Hemshech and Boybrick um, created alternatives to it. Um, so their differing political and religious standpoints infused the days with different messages and goals, but actually their programs, which were camp-wide, right, this would be like a big thing happening in the auditorium the, the night before, and then a whole day of activities remembering various forms of Jewish tragedy proved very, very similar in tone as well as in order. All camps use stories of Jewish heroism as counterbalances for the sadness of the day, drawing inspiration from Warsaw Ghetto and resistance fighters, Israeli soldiers, or both, depending on their ideological orientations. Addressing the Holocaust, uh, camp education, uh, sorry, educators came to believe, uh, sorry, addressing the Holocaust, educators came to believe, functioned as a particularly powerful tool in their efforts to change Jewish culture through the next generation not only because it afforded a chance to underscore the relevance of their camp's nationalist, religious, and linguistic ideologies, but because campers sourced deep commitments to their Jewishness through stories of Jewish suffering. Um, this brings me to language. Uh, of, for most of Jewish history, Jews were multilingual, able to speak both the languages of the majority language of the wider society in which they lived, um, and Jewish languages. Post-war American Jews, however, were overwhelmingly monolingual, following in the footsteps of immigrant generations that quickly embraced English as their lingua franca. Um, as they sought to turn the tides of what they saw as Jewish authenticity, Jewish educators across the ideological spectrum came to see Jewish languages as paramount in their efforts. Um, so here we see an example from Camp Masad, which was trying to be Hebrew speaking, trying to be the operative word. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and they invented names, even they invented terms for baseball, you know, the most quintessential American thing, Camp Masad made sure there was a Hebrew uh, word or phrase for every single aspect of it. Um, a lot of camps also had little dictionaries around so that you would be encouraged to use Hebrew, you know, at the table or in the bunk. Um, and some camps just basically gave worksheets out almost like homework uh, and would have formal education for language. So here's a, a worksheet from Camp Hemshech where I think, what are they supposed to do here? They're, they're, yeah, it's just different, different grammatical, um, grammatical exercises. And uh, I love this. So Camp Massad being so Hebraic in their ideology tried to keep a lot of American pop culture, I think, out. But when they allowed it in, they said, okay, well, if you're going to do that, you have to translate it into Hebrew. So I found many, many funny examples of translations of like Beatles songs or Bob Dylan into Hebrew so that kids could continue to engage with the pop culture they loved from home. So, okay, I'll get to that in a second. I'll mention about Hebrew and Yiddish that really, this fantasy of the Hebrew Yiddish speaking camp quickly clashed with the broader linguistic realities of the Jewish community and also the campers lack of enthusiasm, which really challenged educators plans. The issue of language was a source of substantial hand wringing and tension, showing that pa the power that children had to change camp programs and American Jewish life in turn. You can't force children to speak a language they either don't know how to speak or don't want to speak. So camps had to figure out what to do. Um, and a lot in most of the cases that meant decreasing the focus on Hebrew and Yiddish over time or changing it into a more symbolic uh, form. 
Um, and finally, Camp Leaders incorporated various aspects of democratic education into the camp schedule and environment. This vision of camping was not unique to Jewish institutions. Um, in fact, American summer camp leaders, Jewish and Christian alike, enthusiastically adopted a point of view that camps are kind of like children's republics. Um, and this was inspired by educational philosophers like John Dewey. Um, but while Jewish camps continued this tradition of the democratic to uh, American camp, they also reframed their purposes in doing so, emphasizing how democracy could fit into their broader visions of passing Jewish authenticity onto children. So at Zionist camps, they brought in ideas about how kibbutzim um, made their decisions in various kinds of asefot, different kinds of meetings. And uh, at, at camps that were more socialist, they would evoke labor unions or the Bund back in Eastern Europe. Um, Reform and conservative camps also brought democracy into the into the camp life, um, and they would bring that into they would kind of relate that to their parent movement's broader valuing of democracy. Uh, in their programs, educators depicted democracy as an inherently Jewish way to organize, govern, and act, and portrayed the idea that that um, that uh, that the movements themselves really embraced American and democracy. So, so far, I've mostly talked about the top-down dynamic, how staff infuse their ideologies into camp life. Uh, but as I mentioned before, life at camp actually occurred within a much more nuanced dynamic. Um, camp leaders actually embraced democracy because they saw benefits in involving youth in the implementation of their own transformations. Um, adapting the model to address the desires of campers for greater freedom within camp democratic education shifted in the 1960s as American youth more broadly protested, walked out and led social change movements. Youth at Jewish camps increasingly sought to expand their rights at camp and contribute to, if not alter, their camp's political, religious and ideological landscapes. Through camper counselors, and, uh, sorry, camp, camper councils and assemblies in which elected representatives or the entire camper body took on the task of representing their interests to the staff, Educators aim to bring campers into decision-making processes of life at camp, but in controlled and limited ways. Staff members also inserted regular times in their schedules for campers to debate their core, camp's core ideologies, such as language, nationalism, the Sabbath, and more. And camp newspapers became central organisms of camp's democratic uh, experiments, providing youth a mechanism for praising camp, critiquing camp, and most crucially, parodying camp. These camps, these camp newspapers are hilarious. Um, this is an example of a piece from one of them. Much like student governments in American schools, these various forms of democracy did not allow campers to flip the pyramids of power or change the underlying ideologies of their camps. In this particular example, uh, a camper mentions that um, on on Thursday, we voted on things to do on Shabbat. One of them, one of the things was swearing on Shabbat. First, we voted that it was okay. Then Larry, who was a counselor, steps in and says, no, it's camp rules not to swear. Well, that's nice for camp rules. If there's such a, if, if this is a government of our own, there is no such thing as abiding to camp rules. So this is what you call freedom. <laughs> is this what you call being free? So campers are also aware of the fact that these, these democratic structures, much like student governments, are not really giving them their, their full freedom. Um, and yet in response to camper behaviors, educators really believed that giving them the illusion of democracy helped alleviate problems uh, caused by power imbalances. Um, through bringing campers into the running of camp, allowing them to complain loudly and proudly and even stage protests, uh, they would come, they believed, to associate camp life with freedom, allowance, and fun. And camp leaders wanted campers to come away feeling that they the way they transformed into authentic Jews was something they did by their own volition, not something that came from the top down. Um, while a camp's influence on youth has a lot to do with all of these different rituals of daily life that I talked about, this distinctive incorporation of leniency, freedom, and recreation with ideology and control really lays at the core of camp power, leading youth to believe that their camp's cultural, political, and religious values were one and the same with their own. Taking a second. Camp leaders, 
came to see that democracy alone would not be enough to achieve this goal. They would have to allow a certain degree of laxity or structured mayhem, as one scholar calls it, to create an environment that would yield camper buy-in. In no area of camp life did they lean into this idea more than in the realm of camper romance, dating, and sexuality. Much like in American culture writ large, making out, going steady, and developing crushes encompassed central aspects of Jewish camper culture in the 1950s, the frequency of references to romance and sex at camp increasing throughout the 1960s and 70s. Camp newspapers written by campers and supervised by staff provide a crucial window into camper culture surrounding romance. Um, news reports on camp socials, such as the 1963 report on a dance at Camp Hemshech, which in which a camper promised uh, praised the quote candlelight, which added a romantic touch and helped set the mood for the evening, ran alongside advice columns like that were kind of modeled after Dear Abby, like this one, which allowed campers to address their interest in the opposite sex through humor and also anonymity. Internal documents of head staff rarely included descriptions of or responses to camps' romantic or sexual cultures, nor did camps' handbooks mention the issue directly. However, in the 1960s, Camp Vermont in Wisconsin, uh, the head staff members there had an ongoing discussion in their yearly reports over how much freedom campers should have at night and at what ages during, um, I'm sorry, and at what ages they should have those freedoms, specifically during the last period of the daily schedule, which displays how they aim to build, create a balance between what campers wanted and what the, they believe the boundaries of age appropriate behavior should be. Romance and sexuality encompassed a main aspect of Jewish youth's desires and interests within the world of the camp, and it became a more public part of camp life during the same years that the broader sexual revolution took place in America. Rather than placing more limits on campers' behaviors with the opposite sex, however, most camp leaders saw a purpose in providing campers time for romantic and quote-unquote age-appropriate forms of sexual contact. Like their limited forms of democracy, giving campers the freedom to explore and openly discuss their romantic and sexual interests provided a helpful counterbalance to the heavily ideological and educational programs of these camps. As concerns over rising rates of intermarriage in the late 60s and 70s took hold within the ranks of Jewish institutions, furthermore, camp leaders saw a role in supporting and fostering opportunities for camp romance in their efforts of molding new generations of youth and as a method towards infusing Jewish youth with an appreciation for marrying within the faith. Camp leaders did address the issue of intermarriage head on through speeches and guided discussions surrounding the perceived dangers of marrying out both to the individual and to the community. To model Jewish relationships, camps across the ideological spectrum had their campers or counselors role play Jewish weddings in front of the entire camp in full costume under a chuppah. These ceremonies aim to teach campers wedding rituals as a form of exper experiential education, prompting campers beforehand to quote, consider the importance of each part of the ceremony, at least at one camp. In other camps, staff's encouragements of approved relationships included lectures and other forms of direct education. What romance, dating, and sexual culture at camp provide a win window into though, is how campers' desires and interests cannot be distilled into simple binaries of youth expressing their agency to counter adult controls. Rather, youth's interest in the opposite sex became intertwined with camp, both because campers' desires were inevitable and normal parts of adolescence, and because educators found ways to make it into something they viewed as useful in the growing communal focus on curbing interfaith marriage. The story of dating and what would later be called hookup culture at camp shows that youth's desires ended up converging and complying with adult priorities the priority to encourage American Jewish youth towards marrying within the faith at a time when fewer and fewer would. Fearful of decline and mournful in the wake of the Holocaust, post-war Jews grappled with questions surrounding the Jewish future within the world of the summer camp, creating and reconstituting old modes of being Jewish for the second half of the 20th century. Through daily activities, play, mourning the Holocaust, speaking Hebrew and Yiddish, and inculcating camp life with, dem with democracy, Educators taught campers, quote, quote, ways of being Jewish through having them live Jewishly. But achieving their fantasies of saving Jewish culture from decline required the energy and inspiration of the next generation in order to find success. And as the generations at camp negotiated the texture and the, the purposes and texture of camp life, both indirectly and directly, 
these camps changed older ideologies and modes for their historical moments. In the case of Zionism, the ideologies educators hoped to pass on never led to a mass immigration of American Jews to Israel, although some moved, nor did it make kids fluent, although some became fluent, but it did turn Zionism into a tool for finding Jewish identity in a moment of multiculturalism and provided a yardstick of authenticity for American kids to measure themselves up against. And this is this continues today. This is a picture from a birthright trip uh, to Glee, birthright Israel. This is sort of a continuation of a similar idea. Israel as a mode of identity building. Yiddishist camps did not succeed in saving Yiddish per se, but they did create a new form of Yiddishism for the post-war moment, which much like Zionism became primarily about sourcing Jewish identity. While Yiddish camps like Hemshech and Boybrick did not survive, they both closed around 1980, they undoubtedly succeeded by a very different overlooked metric, perpetuating Yiddish cultural and linguistic activism and carrying the torch of a kind of diasporism that is very popular among American Jewish young people today uh, in response in many ways to Israel's rightward shift. So in this picture you have on the left, um, Bernie Kampf for uns, Lomer Kampf for Bernie. This was a, a campaign poster for Bernie Sanders uh, created in Yiddish that says, Bernie fights for us, let, or, yeah, fights for or campaigns for, camp, it works for both. Bernie fights for us, let's fight for Bernie. And on the other side, um, a line from a Yiddish song uh, presented at a protest, a Jewish protest. Um, in both the conservative and reform camps, the youthful ethos of the long 60s impacted the way Judaism was practiced in many, many ways, making in both cases uh, Judaism at camp more traditional and uh, what campers and counselors viewed as authentic, as well as helping their movements become more egalitarian. So in the Ramah summer camps in particular, uh, they embraced forms of egalitarianism, having women lead parts of prayer services before the conservative movement did and actually pushed the conservative movement into more feminist directions. Um, these camps also increasingly embraced Zionism over time, indicating how its use as an American Jewish identity tool expanded beyond Zionist movements. So a lot of features of Zionist camping end up entering a much broader array of Jewish summer camps as Zionism becomes a more kind of broad-based part of American Jewish life in the 60s and beyond. In the case of all of these camps, their negotiations around sexuality and romance would have a long lasting impact on American Jewish culture, especially as American Jewish institu institutions became even more focused on mitigating uh, rising rates of intermarriage in the 1970s and beyond. A lot of young people today are pointing out how the kind of allowance and leniency that Jewish summer camps have been kind of famous for um, obviously it can have some upsides. There's a sex positivity element, which is, which is lovely, but also some downsides creating an atmosphere of pressure, um, where consent is not taken seriously and steps are now being taken in the kind of post me too moment to change that. But it shows that, that what happened at camps starting in the 1950s, 1960s, it hasn't had a long legacy and has affected the internal culture of these camps because camp really runs on tradition, internal tradition. So certain things that become normal within camp they stick. So a few con concluding thoughts. Negotiating their powers, visions, and needs, the Jews of summer produced and reconstituted Jewishness for their historical moments, utilizing camp life to mitigate anxieties, play out ideological fantasies, and enact American Jewish dreams. Thinking about summer camps, it could be easy to sink into a comfortable nostalgia for simpler summers past, a time when Jews seemed to align at the very least on the problems that pl plagued them most. But my hope is that this talk and my book more broadly will encourage the very opposite, emboldening, emboldening us to contemplate the ideological weights we place on children, the roles youth play in the making of Jewish culture, and how our conceptions of real or authentic Jewishness can be creatively and productively expanded. Thank you. Great, thank you. That was fascinating. And I have to say, since I'm from Kibbutz of Ikim, I was very, ah. <laughs> I found that picture from 1937, uh, very intriguing. So uh, thank you so much. Um, well, I'm trying to kind of uh, frame a question. Do we have questions on uh, from the audience or, or not yet? So uh, we have one question about federation camps. I'm happy to address that. Okay, um, well, go ahead. 
Amy, my dad went to Surprise Lake. I don't know. I don't know how old you are, but um, great question. So I I do address in the book um, the Federation camps, specifically kind of explaining how they are different from these other forms of camp of Jewish camps. The Federation camps really are very very diverse. Um, they don't all align on how much Jewish education they include, how Zionist they are. They really depend on you know who is the leader and at what time. So they're kind of hard to generalize about, um, but they did become more steadily educational and, and sort of Zionist in their orientations in a lot of cases, starting in the 70s and beyond. So I, oh, great, 60s and 70s. So yeah, so that's like a period where they're becoming more similar to the, the Zionist camps or the Jewish camps of earlier times. Um, and that rises through the 70s and 80s. There are a bunch of... Um, a bunch of different commissions in the Jewish community in response to rising intermarriage where um, they they specifically look at how to make federation camps and other kinds of communal camps more like camps like Ramah, um, very, very pointedly. Um, so I talk about that transition and uh, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting aspect of the story. So thank you for your question. Well, uh, I don't really have any other questions in the chat yet. Yeah, um, so uh, let me pose some questions to you. First of all, I have a question kind of in terms of the research uh, approach. Have you tracked uh, particular individuals that could take you from their camp experience or recollecting their camp experience into adulthood? So that's question number one. To what extent individual stories are part of your research? Mm -hmm. The second question is, how do you assess the future of Jewish camps? Mm -hmm. um, and in, more specifically, do we find a change uh, since 2000, let's say? Uh, are we in a different environment? Because your, your dissertation focused up to 1980, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we are going to go beyond, so in the beginning of the 21st century, do we have something different going on? And if yeah, so, what sure. is it? Okay, so your first question was about oral history and interviews, right? Yeah. Basically. So actually, as a dissertation, I had very little of it. And then I was encouraged rightfully to include it. And it 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 changed the it changed the the nature of the book. I mean, it didn't change any major arguments of the book, but it it's given the book so much more flavor and depth to have these personal stories and it's some of the best parts of the book come from people's personal stories so I conducted about 35 oral history interviews with people from across these decades across these ideological spectrums different I tried to get a good gender balance um spoke to some campers who identify as gay and lesbian to understand how that experience differed um so that was extremely useful um and really makes the book a lot a lot fun to read too um, the other question was about where I think camps are going and where they kind of went after the period. So in the book, as opposed to the dissertation, I don't, I would say the bulk of the book still focuses on the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, but I do have a kind of epilogue style chapter that catches us up. And there's so much to say about that. So if you have a specific thing, I, I'm happy to go deeper, but um, camping, I mean, there's a decline because um, there's a demographic decline. So after the baby boomers grow out of camp, there's a bad moment for Jewish camping where there are a lot of extra beds and not enough people to put in them. And there's also the recession in the 1970s. That challenges camp as air travel becomes cheaper and people can go to Israel. That can also challenge some of these camps that are kind of creating Israel in, you know, the Catskills or wherever they might be. Um, so camp faces a bunch of different economic challenges in the 1970s. Then as intermarriage uh, rates rise and anxiety over intermarriage rises, um, camps get a lot, a lot of Jewish communal investment um, in the 80s, 1990s and continuing really through the present. Um, so that is what is keeping them going, I think in a lot of ways. Um, I do not know, like someone asked about um, what has happened to the Ramah camps and Camp Massad in the 21st century. Ramah is going strong. Camp Massad does not exist anymore in America. There is a Camp Massad in Canada that was like vaguely connected, but not necessarily officially connected. And that's still going. And, um, and asked what percentage of Jewish young people are going to camps. I don't think we have clear data on that. It, it, that's, I, I don't, I've never seen data on that. Um, what is their future? 
it's a great question. I mean, I'm a historian and my knowledge of, you know, the present is based on scholarship about the present, but also just reading, you know, news articles and being in touch with people who are more involved in camping. And camps are still going, but I do think there are a bunch of different challenges uh, for camps in the 21st century. The biggest threat is probably the pressure on teenagers to do everything they can to get into college, which is a shame. You know, I think that we're, we're cutting kids' um, childhoods short. Uh, and uh, that is a challenge. I know, like, this is anecdotal, but my summer camp, I went eight weeks a year, every single year until I was. 16 as a as a camper and then I went as a counselor. Um, now they have shorter sessions that kids can accommodate, you know, college prep programs, SAT programs. So that is the big, that is changing camp a lot. Um, and I don't know what will happen, but there is a lot of communal investment in keeping them going. So I think that they will continue to, to thrive in as many ways as they can. Um, did you have, did you ask anything else about that I missed? Uh, no, the, the, this is great. In, in other words, the question is whether it's a success story or a story of failure. Mm. That's really the problem. I, and we assess the big question. Mm -hmm. What is it? I think it, it depends what your metrics of success are. So almost all of the research about camp is basically about look how successful this form of Jewish education is. Um, look how the children of XYZ Jewish summer camp or youth movement 90% of them married Jews. Look at how they support Israel. Look at this, look at that. Um, that's all good. I mean, it's it's good to know what these camps are doing, how they are producing, like what kinds of Jews they're producing and, and whatnot. But I wanted to look at it differently because I think what's really interesting is how we arrived at these metrics in the first place. So uh, you know, these are not these are not value neutral ideas. The idea that intermarriage is bad and support for Israel should look like this, right? It, it these are these are ideas that the community that may, most of the community seems to land on, but they're they're they have politic they have politics behind them. So I wanted to leave aside those metrics, and then the question of success or failure. It I mean, if you're asking me, I think success from my own personal metrics, but like everyone's metrics are different. So if you were uh, the camp director of Camp Masad, let's say, who hoped to bring to, you know, create like a Hebrew speaking American Jewish public, no, that was a failure. It just depends what you were trying to do. And camps really moved the yardsticks because they had to respond to what was going on in American society, what youth wanted. It's a hard question. I and mean, I think like most people think of these as educational successes and I think it's it's interesting to think about why and like why camp over Hebrew school why camp over I don't know I have anything. an answer to well. that uh, I have an answer to that from the experience of my son in Tel Yehuda in oh. camp you have uh, an integrated and immersive experience mm -hmm. which yeah. was very holistic as yeah. opposed to experiences of youth outside when when you are constantly uh, trying to negotiate uh, very conflicting identities, whether it's my American versus my Jewish, totally. my this versus that. In camp, it's only one identity. So if you start early, that gives a very positive self-esteem and very clear identity, holistic identity. That would be my answer. I I agree with that. I mean, that's what this whole lecture really is about, right? How they constructed everyday camp life to be so immersive. And that is the power of camp. But um I don't know. I wouldn't say that like friends of mine who married non-Jews are examples of camps failing or friends of mine who are critical of the Israeli governments are examples of Zionist camps failing. So, but that is what like demographers and sociologists would imply. So, so it's a very political question, the success mm -hmm. or failure question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went to tell you Huda, by the way, also. <laughs> just to it's... tip my hat. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay, you've got some more questions. I got that some you questions. Respond to. Uh, I, I'm curious whether you observe silences, exclusions, or harms in addition to dominant formations of identity you examined. Um, Madeline, would you mind like um, maybe uh, going into a little bit more detail there? I mean, I definitely observed. I definitely spoke to former campers who said camp was not. An 100% good experience for me. I got bullied. 
I felt inadequate. Um, I felt a lot of pressure to have a boyfriend. If, I, if you didn't have a boyfriend, you weren't cool. Um, those sorts of elements, I think. And, and also some campers from some of the more left-wing Zionist camps talked about as they got older, realizing that camp made them feel like they could be whoever they want to be, or they could they could be different, but they had to be the exact same kind of different. So there was a countercultural element to camp life, but also a lot of conformity. Um, I don't know if that's what you meant. If you wanna if you wanna elaborate, I'm happy to get into that more. Um, thank you, Alan, for that comment about Camp Swig, which is in the book. Um, was there ever an association of Jewish camps in America? Does one exist? Um, yeah, there have been multiple, like not, I wouldn't say strong associations, but over the years, there were various camp director organizations for Jewish camping. And now I forgot what year it started, but in the last, I wanna say 20 years or so, 10 to 20 years, there's an organization called the Foundation for Jewish Camp, which tries to be, um, I don't know if it would be an association. It's a foundation for Jewish camp, but it brings camp leaders together. It does a lot of trainings for counselors. It's created a kind of umbrella um, that all the camps are under, including a lot of the Orthodox camps, which is really wonderful that they've kind of brought these groups together. Um, okay, yes, curious about the texture and experience at the moment over time, great. Um, yes, also understand the pervasiveness of sexual harassment and wonder if that emerged during oral histories. It definitely did. Um, yes, a lot of, um, a lot of oral histories brought up less so sexual harassment in terms of like, uh, experience of, of rape or just experiences, not consent, but, um, problems of counselors dating campers, whether that was technically illegal, according to American law or not just the power imbalances, you know, because of like a counselor could be only one or two years older than a camper in some cases, but there were a lot of examples of those sorts of boundaries being crossed and a lot of people bringing that up. Um, and I think more so than sexual harassment in the period that I studied, it was like the idea of the pressure to be part of um, the sexual culture of camp. Oh, 25 years old. Okay, so I was closer when I said 20. Great, thank you, Andrea. Foundation for Jewish Camp is 25 years old. Um, those are all the questions I so see. I would okay, like yeah. to go back to your title. In your title, mm -hmm. you talk about nature. So what is yeah. the degree of uh, nature education, environmental awareness, and anything that has to do with the environment rather than with Judaism? How did that feature into your analysis? It, it really didn't feature into the camps I studied at the time I studied them so much, or at least not in ways that pop up in the archives. Of course, there are just certain activities that don't leave behind written archival materials so much, like Shabbat, for instance. Shabbat gets very little attention in my book because Shabbat is this experience that doesn't necessarily leave behind a lot of, of not much of a paper trail. Of course, people talked about Shabbat and the meaning of Shabbat at camp and how much they loved Shabbat at camp, but documents not so much. So yeah, of course, at these camps, you know, people would go on hiking trips, they would build fires, they would... Um, would experience nature they would use the you know if camp had a lake or a river um but i would say as opposed to camps that you know sponsored by the scouting movement or um even just some of the christian camps that were really focused on nature these camps were focused much more on the jewish educational aspect and camp was simply the backdrop for it you know the nature was the backdrop yeah okay. i think you also have people who raise their hand if you can call them oh that. sure uh, I'm sorry, I'm Mindy. Sorry. Yeah, Mindy also wrote something in the yeah in the chat. Mindy, can you hear me? This is Lisa. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Uh huh. Um. Also, um, I don't know how if if you saw my comment in the chat, um, but our one of our um colleagues in Phoenix from the uh um from what was the Jewish Federation. I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to call it the wrong name, Andrea. Um, is on the phone and just wanted to kind of give a two second pitch for what our community does to send um, students uh, to camp. So okay. I, uh, uh, let let Hava know that that's it. That we, we need to do that before we finish up. Okay. Okay. So uh, should I should I answer Mindy first? Um, yeah. Go ahead. 
Okay. So Mindy asked, what does the Foundation for Jewish Camps try to promote? What, what is it trying to reach the camp directors and counselors? Um, I am actually meeting with them soon to talk about ways to, to interact and to, to like, you know, provide my book maybe for some of their trainings. So people have a historical background as they go into their planning of the summer. So I don't know that much about it. I think they're really focusing on leadership development um, more so than anything else, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, yeah, I think that's it in the questions. Well, and uh, well, no, you've got some more coming in. <laughs> oh, more coming in? Yeah, you have to see. look at, uh, lower your, scroll down and you'll see everything. Yeah, 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 I scrolled down. Oh, okay, now I see. They kind of like popped up in a weird order. Um, did you gain any insight on the transition between time at camp and going back <laughs> into the real world? I recall my years at camp that did create a social tension in our lives and many young people did not return to camp because of that. And those of us who did return felt duplicity in our lives that was also challenging. Yeah, it was often challenging. I really get that. Um, yes, um, people talked about that. And um, one of my chapters is all about time at camp and it's partly about how camp was organized, you know, according to the schedule that I was talking about. And of course the monthly schedule, the weekly schedule, it's Shabbat, but it's also about the way that that intensity, that 24 seven nature of camp is um, really emotionally intense. And then when it's over, there's a huge drop to that. It's like being at a, for kids who really like camp, it's like being at a kind of never ending crescendo for four weeks or eight weeks. And then you go home and it's like a completely different world and you have to readjust. And I think that is really challenging. Um, I personally, I had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, never enough to not go back to camp, but I 100% understand what you're saying. I, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about the financing of the camps, especially in the last 20 years? You said that there's some real money coming from federations, but who really I'm not, I'm really not an expert. I'm not really an expert on contemporary camps. Everyone's asking me questions. I'm so sorry. I, I mean, I, I don't know that much about, I, I know that like the foundation for Jewish camp is a, is a huge um, part of where money comes from. There have been initiatives um, in the last decade or two um, that I've heard about that are bringing uh, children of Soviet parents into camp you know, or even parents whose parents were from the Soviet Union. These, this is a group that is sort of still not part of this, you know, aspect of American Jewish life. So trying to bring them in. Um, where does the money come from? Comes from Jews who are anxious about the future of Judaism, just like I think in the post-war period, I think. I mean, it's the same thing of like, where does the money for birthright come from? Where does the money for, I mean, American young American Jews don't need to pay for anything Jewish up until their 30s because everything is paid for by some foundation or so, you know some nonprofit, um, mm. and we don't always know who. Sometimes it's anonymous. Yes, very interesting. And do you have the numbers in the period that you did study? 1945 to 1980, what, what are the numbers that we are talking about of the population of youngsters going to camps in a given year, let's say, you can probably do it by years. Yeah, in a given year, I mean, it, it, it depended on the decade, but I, I saw numbers like 65,000, you know, in, in these particular kinds of Jewish camps, so not Jewish camps at all, which is quite a lot. It's a lot, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. I also yeah. wanna mention that the um, these camps, of course, charge tuition, so, they do get they do get money from foundations for scholarships and for things like leadership training or but they raise their own money from their alumni also and they mostly run on tuition they're very expensive ventures um, that's another challenge I think that camps are facing right now is that you know the cost of everything is higher and that makes camp really expensive um, I'm not I mean I'm 34 I wasn't I mean I'm not that I'm I'm not from that I was a child not that long ago I guess I mean kind of long ago but not so long not long ago as my historical actors and back then I knew lots of people who went to camp for four weeks eight weeks and now the sessions are getting shorter also to accommodate the fact that the prices are getting higher so this is also you know this is where money comes from is tuition but it's also a challenge do they um, partially because college, college is so expensive that you 
have to save all the money for college how can you pay for camp what do you say Hannah? that's that's true another question would be what do they allow for technology like cell phones and whatever to into the no that's interesting. no that's yeah interesting. for the most part these camps try to keep them out i mean i don't know if all camps do and and like how their policies differ but i'm pretty sure most of them really try to keep them out and often don't succeed and parents i think i've, I've heard stories that like parents also help their children trick the camp so they'll they'll ask for your cell phone at the beginning of the summer. The counselor will take it away. The kid will have a, sec a second secret cell phone. Well, you can do a paper just on that phenomenon. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a digital Shabbat for a whole summer or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Let's see if we have any other. There are some comments from uh, Andrea, if you can. Uh... Oh, yeah. That the Foundation for Jewish Camps. FJC is providing huge funding to create new camps and push for sustainability of camps long term. Absolutely. And also their One Happy Camper, their new camper initiative. That is a big thing. They try to give scholarships to new campers because I guess the retention rates of camps are very good. So if you get kids in the first year and you give them a scholarship and then they say to their parents, I want to go back, then they're more likely to go back. So it is, it's a very, it's a very smart idea. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> if you go to, back to Andrea's name. Yeah. You can, there, you can see there's uh, three dots. Okay. So either any of those allow you to give give her the microphone, let her talk. Oh yeah, I can do that. It's in a different spot. One second. Oh, sorry. Andrea. Allow to talk. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much. Oh, good. It's Rich Casper's picture that's popping up. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Andrea Cohen, not Rich Casper, with the Center for Jewish Philanthropy here in Phoenix. We represent the integration of the Federation and the Foundation, and I am uh, being able to speak to you all tonight because our Center for Jewish Philanthropy has a robust camp scholarship program. It's a needs-based camp scholarship program for children who live in Maricopa County who want to go to Jewish camp anywhere in North America, as long as it's a Jewish nonprofit summer camp. And I will say that when we talk about the rates uh, that camps are charging these days. It is so expensive. Yeah. Um, and camps are not sustaining themselves on the fees mm -hmm. alone. There's so much more that needs to go in, but camps are in excess of $6,000 for just under four weeks of camp um, for most reform conservative camps in the Western United States. So it's a lot. So we try and help families participate in camp uh, with a needs-based scholarship program. So if you have someone in your life that is hoping to go to camp this summer, please go to our phoenixcjp.org website um, and you will be able to find information about our camps program. And I'm happy to help people. That's really nice. Thanks for, for sharing that. Yeah, that's it. So well, let's see, if, do we have other questions or, oh, or, or comments no uh, i think that i think that's it that that's mm -hmm. it okay so i i agree that this was uh, as uh, etty zilber said, stated in her comment on the q a this this has been very uh kind of uh, enlightening it's really wonderful to think especially in retrospect um how camps have been important in the formation of jewish identity and what would american what would the American Jewish history be without the camps? So we, in a, in a sense, we all, uh, those who grew up in America, I didn't, but those who grew up in America should be very um, grateful, I guess, to some extent, if, if you went to camp, because it could have been quite different without it. So thank you so much for your excellent research and sharing all this with us. And uh, I remind people who are still on the on the call that um our next activity is next thursday uh, we're going to talk about uh jewish historical societies with joel gerboff and then we have the conference on uh judaism and artificial intelligence which is really truly international we have people from all over the world literally uh sharing their knowledge with us and we have more activities also in uh march so thank you all for 
coming uh, and joining this experience of learning. And I'll see you all next week. And good night. Good night. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So, Sandy, this was this was great. <laughs> so Thank you, you. were tell you who the where it, it, were you in North Carolina? I was in Young Judea, Sprout Lake, and then tell you who the so New York, both New York. New York, yeah. This okay, is I got you because uh -huh. Sandy, I bought your book as soon as Hello? I heard about uh, the the presentation. It was absolutely phenomenal. And in you. addition to my role at the Center for Jewish Philanthropy, I'm like living my little girl dream. And for the past 14 years now, I go back to LA and I'm the director of the camp I grew up at. Oh, oh that's wow. so nice. That's exciting. And <laughs> and so what you were sharing, it was so nice to see the continuity that we're still doing the yeah. same thing. And it's Nikayon right after after breakfast. And 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 it just it's it's wonderful. And I love how you pulled all this information. And I'm really excited to dive into your book. Thank um, you. I'm so excited that like people who are involved in camping today will finally get a chance to read it because I do think the history, it gives us so much perspective on what camps do today. Like my, my best friend is a Jewish educator. And so she got, you know, I've had copies since December. So she's already read it. And her reactions are just so exciting to me because I want this to be read by academics, of course, but I also want it to be useful to people on the ground. And I think it, I hope it will be. You know, I, I was going through my grandparents' belongings a gazillion years ago, and they were they were long gone. And I was going through a box that my mom had discovered, and in it was a history of the first 25 years of our camps written oh, by Rabbi yeah. Wolf. And it was fascinating. Yeah. And and it's it's so nice what you were able to glean about how camps have impacted the Jewish life in America and how the kids have had a part in deciding how we're going to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Andrew, are you, you. Uh, Andrew, are you optimistic about the future of Jewish camps? I am. And I have to tell you, Foundation for Jewish Camp has come in and they are the organization that has absolutely I think saved and professionalized the field of Jewish camping and the investments that they're making in specialty camps, because we talk mm -hmm. about what's going to pull kids out of camp, what's pulling kids back in is that we do have sports camps that are specializing so that the kids who want to play high school sports don't have to miss out because they're going yeah. to Jewish camp or kids that are focused on the arts. Um, technology and science. There are these specialty camps that are happening now. And Foundation for Jewish Camp is making sure that the long-term sustainable plans for camps are in place. Yeah. And so they've it's worked really with Harold Grinspoon and the endowment building and the legacy building and legacy planning that they're doing right now, it's phenomenal. And they've got great, great programs that they're doing that are really helping the field. And it's a real diverse group of camps that play in this with the, the FJC. Yeah. So I'm feeling good, good about things. Interesting. And, Interesting. Yeah, and our scholarship Again, it's program. An example of, it's an example of camps changing because the culture has changed. They have to respond. And it's partly because the children, like because of what the youth want. They want absolutely. Want. Whether absolutely. they want it or they feel they have to have it, both is probably happening, but a great example. When when I first started back at camp, I wasn't writing community service letters for kids. And then I found yeah. ways to write them community service letters so that when they're going back to school, there's more value in what they're doing. And we work with our staff on how to professionalize what they've done over the course of the summer for resume building. Wow. Interesting. So, so it's, it's a really interesting field. So um, I'm very excited to read your book. And is okay, there a competition, uh, Andrea? I don't know if Andrea or Sandy can answer. Is there a competition between the camp experience during the summer and going to Israel during the summer? Um, the camps have built it in. Yeah. So most camps have, and it's a brilliant way it works too, is you finish your camper year and then in a break between being a camper and being a counselor, camps do an Israel trip. 
Oh, yeah. So most camps That's have an Israel trip. And now with Route 1, um, there's significant funding to help high school kids get back to Israel. And then that also speaks to the whole sexualization of the staff yeah. and the camper experience. You can separate the campers and the staff by having this gap year where they go to Israel. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then they bring in Israelis. The Mishlachat are, are phenomenal. And, and the Jewish agency does a wonderful job of training them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Ooh, they, well, the nice Hebrew text, uh, Sandy, the Hebrew text that you shared, <laughs> it is so fascinating. I know. Because it's nobody so talks Hebrew in that. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, it's really, really very funny. elevated Hebrew. <laughs> very elevated. Very elevated. I love it. Yeah. So that's, that's why the cool. kids cannot, of course, they rebelled against it because they realized that it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. It's very good where you are. And we yeah. wish you a very successful uh, rest of the semester and the year. And we're all going to look. You. I'm, I'm going to order your book and I'm going to send one copy to my son. <laughs> ah, great. Well, I'll tell you right now, Stanford is running a really good sale. It's only $19. I'm going to send it in the chat. Oh, I should have sent that to everyone. Damn. Oh, well. All right. All right. Thanks a lot. And Bye. Sure we'll see you in some other Association sure. for Jewish Studies activities. All right. Take that, care. Good okay. night. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lisa, too. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.